Hello, everyone, and thanks for tuning in to Patient Needs for Novel Therapies in ROS1 Fusion Positive Non Small Cell Lung Cancer. Today's webinar is sponsored by Anhart. Next slide. I'm Janet Freeman Daly, a lung cancer patient, research advocate, and co founder and president of the Ross Wonders. I will be moderating today's Endpoints webinar. Joining me are Dr. Misako Nagasaka, thoracic oncologist and associate professor at the University of California, Irvine, and Dr. Ross Kamage, professor, director of thoracic oncology, and Joyce Zeff, chair in lung cancer research at the University of Colorado Cancer Center. The presenters have agreed to use first names during this presentation. If you have any questions, please be sure to hit the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We've reserved some time at the end of this webinar to answer your questions. Please note the speakers are not able to answer questions about diagnosis or treatment for individual patients. Dr. Masako Nagasaka will get us started by talking about the current treatment landscape of ROS1 positive non-small cell lung cancer. Masako, I'll stop sharing slides and you can share yours. All right, so I'll be talking about the current landscapes of treatment for ROS1 positive non-small cell lung cancer patients. As we all know, ROS1 is a proto-oncogene that encodes the receptor tyrosine kinase ROS1. The kinase domain of ROS1 fuses to a gene partner in various adult and pediatric cancers including up to 2% of non-small cell lung cancer. The ROS1 fusion proteins are always on. The gene rearrangement drives tumor cell proliferation, survival, and metastasis. So ROS1 rearrangement occurs in about 2% of non-small cell lung cancer patients. But as seen here on this figure, ROS1 translocations have been discovered in other tumors, including salivary gland cancer, thyroid cancer, cholangiocarcinoma, gastric cancer, ovarian cancer, and glioblastoma multiform, as well as others. In fact, ROS1 fusion was first discovered in a glioblastoma multiform in 1987. Of the estimated 1.5 million new cases of non-small cell lung cancer worldwide each year, approximately 15,000 may be driven by the oncogenic ROS1 fusion. This calculates to approximately 3,000 to 4,000 new patients with ROS fusion in non-small cell lung cancer in the United States each year. Next slide, please. ROS1 tyrosine kinase inhibitors, or TKIs for short, are the current standard of care for ROS1 positive non-small cell lung cancer in the US and in many countries. The current treatment options include the FDA approved TKIs of crizotinib and entrectinib. There are other TKIs with activity against ROS1, and these include seritinib, loratinib, and cabozantinib. In certain scenarios, platinum pemetrexate based chemotherapy combinations can be considered. And in a situation when TKI or chemotherapy for that matter is being used and there are only one or a few sites of progression, local radiation therapy and continuation of the TKI could also be considered. Next slide, please. Here are some of the key considerations when choosing a TKI. Obviously, you want it to be efficacious in the body and in the brain. Some TKIs have better brain penetration compared to others. This is a critical point because brain metastases are common with ROS1 positives. At the time of diagnosis, approximately 20 to 30% of patients with ROS1 positive disease are thought to present with brain metastasis. Some TKIs have activity against the resistant mutations such as G2032R. 
And the treatment efficacy may be different in the treatment naive scenario versus those who have been pre-treated. So there are also things to think about. And equally important are the side effect profile. You want a drug that works, but something that is well tolerated. Next slide, please. Here is a slide comparing the commonly used ROS1 TKIs. Of note, we should be careful when we cross compare trials, given the differences in the patient population, including the number of patients that are in each study. I'm going to take some time here and first go over the basics, then each drug one by one. So for the basics, if you look at the table, you could see that starts off with the ROS1 TKIs, the MAKER, ORR, intracranial ORR, MPFS, approval status, limitations, and evidence. So first of all, ORR stands for objective response rate, and it is most commonly evaluated by the radiologist using the RESIST criteria. Typically, patients are identified with a few target lesions throughout their course of treatment. These spots are usually areas that are easy to measure, like a lung nodule or a lymph node or liver metastasis. And ideally, the measurements should be easily reproducible. When the sum of the target lesions decreases more than 30% without evidence of new lesions, it is considered to have reached partial response. Complete response is when target lesions are no longer visible and there are no new lesions. The objective response rate, or ORR, is the rate of those who entered into partial response or complete response out of everyone treated on that study. Progression is defined as increase in target lesions of more than 20% or new lesions, and stable disease is a term describing the condition in between partial response and progression of disease. Intracranial ORR is the version um, we use to evaluate response um, in the brain. PFS stands for progression-free survival and is typically measured from the time of start of therapy until progression of disease. MPFS stands for median PFS. So now I will start to go over one um, drug at a time. We'll start with the first line, which is Crizotinib or Zalcori. ROS1 structure is actually very similar to ALK, and ALK and ROS1 share 77% of amino acid identity within the ATP binding sites. Due to this high degree of homology between the ALK and ROS1 tyrosine kinase domains, the ROS1 tyrosine kinase have been known to be highly sensitive to crizotinib in preclinical models and from case reports. The FDA approval of crizotinib in patients with ROS1 non-small cell lung cancer was based on the expansion cohort of the phase one study evaluating crizotinib in 50 patients with ROS1. As you can see here, the objective response rate was 66% and the median progression-free survival was 19.3 months. The most common adverse events or side effects are visual impairment, diarrhea, nausea, and peripheral edema. Important to note here, if you look at the limitation section of this slide, that there was um, limited efficacy in ROS1 patients with brain metastasis with crizotinib, as in a real world analysis, up to 47% of patients experienced CNS progression. G2032R was found as a resistance mutation after treatment on crizotinib, and it was found in 41% of these patients. Next, I'll move on to entrectinib. 
efficacy of entrectinib at various doses and schedules was evaluated in three multi-center single arm clinical trials, the ALCA, Star Trek I, and Star Trek II. Out of 172 patients, the objective response rate was 67%, and median PFS was 16.8 months. Out of 51 patients, the intracranial objective response rate was 49%. And Tractinib gained FDA approval in August of 2019 and was approved in Europe in May of 2020. The most common treatment-related adverse events of any grade were fatigue, dysgesia, paresthesia, nausea, and myalgias. For the most part, entrectinib was well tolerated. Most of the treatment-related adverse events were low grade. Because entrectinib is also a potent TREK A, B, and C inhibitor, the occurrence of adverse events potentially related to TREK inhibition, such as dizziness, weight gain, paresthesias, and cognitive changes, was not unexpected. Now I'll move on to seritinib. For seritinib, there is data, but it is limited to a smaller number of patients with ROS1. As you can see here, out of the 30 patients that were crizotinib naive, the objective response rate was 67%. The median progression-free survival was 19.3 months, again, for crizotinib naive patients. The most common adverse events for all treated patients were diarrhea, nausea, and anorexia. Now the last slide, which is loratinib or Lograna. Loratinib has data in both TKI naive and TKI refractory ROS1 positive non-small cell lung cancer. 69 patients with ROS1 positive non-small cell lung cancers were enrolled in the study, and 21 of the 69 were TKI naive. 40 had received crizotinib as their only TKI, and eight had previously received one non-crizotinib ROS1 TKI or two or more TKIs. In the TKI naive group, the ORR was 62%, and in one prior TKI pretreated patients, the objective response rate was 35%, as seen on this table. Median PFS was 21 months for TKI naive and 8.5 months for one prior TKI pretreated patients. The intracranial response rate was 54%. The most common grade three or four treatment related adverse events were hypertriglyceridemia and hypercholesteremia. As you can see from this table, while seritinib and loratinib have not been FDA approved for this indication, they are on the NCCN guidelines. Perhaps the most important point from this table is the fact that these agents are ineffective against the resistant mutation of G2032R. In summary, the tyrosin kinase inhibitors, crizotinib and trectinib, and other agents have been used to treat ROS1 positive patients, but have been limited by the emergence of ROS1 resistant mutations, progression of disease in the CNS, or treatment related adverse events associated with off target kinase inhibition. But there are now multiple emerging options that are basically being developed in attempts to address these issues. I will now hand over to Dr. Kamich who will go over these new and upcoming agents. Thank you, Masako. Um, I'm gonna talk about some of the emerging treatment options. And as they're emerging, you'll see that we don't have perfect data on all of them. As Masako already mentioned, there are things that we could do better. Now, this obviously depends on whether you're newly diagnosed with metastatic disease and trying to decide the first drug you go on, or you've been on a drug and then your cancer after initially responding has progressed. But in essence, everybody would like to have long-term control of their disease. 
we tend to use abbreviations like duration of response. So if your cancer shrinks down to the extent that Masako mentioned, how long does that last? Or median progression-free survival, which includes those who do as well as do not manifest an objective response. We've already heard that ROS1 does spread to the brain. Because ROS1 is rare, some of the early data sets suggested that there was a lower rate of brain metastases, but that seems to have been disproven in a larger data set. So we want to be able to control and or treat disease within the brain and not just rely on radiation therapy. We know that when you start on a ROS1 TKI, your cancer will eventually evolve and it can evolve in different ways. One of the issues is if it evolves in the manifestation of different mutations in ROS1 built on top of what you already started with, some of those are sensitive to some drugs and some of them are sensitive to others. So the ability to target, or if you start on these, suppress these required resistance mutations from the get-go becomes important. And then let's not forget that, you know, hopefully you're, you're going to be on these treatments for a long time. And I do believe that the strategy here should be perfect control of cancer and perfect quality of life. So avoidance of side effects and maintaining quality of life on these treatments becomes important because maybe we don't achieve that goal every time, but that should be our ambition. Janet told me uh, over the weekend that this is 10 years since she's actually started on therapy. So even low-grade irritating side effects for 10 years can certainly drive you bonkers. Next slide, please. So we're going to focus on three of the new kids on the block. Talatrectinib, which is made by the people who are sponsoring this seminar. Um, it received FDA breakthrough therapy designation, which means that the FDA has said, this is interesting. We're going to look at the data really quickly when you submit it. It doesn't mean it's approved. And it has that breakthrough therapy designation, both in those who have never received treatment and in those who have previously received a TKI. Repotrectinib, which is probably the one that might get licensed first, similarly has received FDA breakthrough therapy designation in the same two categories. And then the most recent one is a drug made by the company called Nuvalent, NBL520. And literally within the last few weeks, we saw the, the first preliminary data shown across a range of different doses whilst they're starting the study in terms of developing the drug in people. Next slide. So we're going to do something which we all know is wrong. So, you know, you've got these incomplete data sets, some of which are still evolving, but we're going to put them side by side. And the reason I'm going to do that is partly to say how much do we take at face value, but also to try and tell you what pinches of salt you need to take when you're looking at these data. Next slide, please. We're going to put them in some bar graphs. So let's look at the response rate. So if you remember, this is the proportion of patients who achieve a shrinkage of their cancer by 30% or more. And I put them into two different categories. So TKI naive, so a patient with metastatic cancer who starts on a ROS1 TKI initially. And you can see that low unmet, uh, an unmet need is perhaps not low response rate. You know, even the worst drug is still over 60%. Um, when you start to get to something and you're saying, well, is 79% different from 93%, the questions you need to ask are, one, how many patients have actually been treated? You know, if you have treated only five patients, that number could jump around a lot. The other question you need to ask is, how were these patients diagnosed? So there are different ways of diagnosing ROS1 positivity. Some is with next generation sequencing, some is with immunohistochemistry, some is with FISH, and they have different false positive and false negative rates. So you have to take with a pinch of salt that you're assuming that these are all diagnosed in the same way. And that may not be true. So is 66% meaningfully different from 93%? Well, if the 93%, they've all had very stringent diagnosis of ROS1, they're more likely to respond. Um, and if they've all had, you know, for the crizotinib studies, they probably had fish testing, which is more likely to, to miss some things. Maybe you, you got some false positives in there. Finally, the other thing that one wants to throw out when you're talking about these proportions in a TKI naive population is where were the lesions that they were measuring located in the body? And sounds like a strange thing to ask. So one is obviously, were they in the body or were they in the brain? And they can have very different outcomes. You can't tell from these figures, the split of these things. The chrysotinib data set rather famously has never revealed whether there were any brain metastases in those patients at all. 
The other thing is we very recently published a paper showing that even the location of the lesions within your chest, whether they're in the bulk of the lung or whether on the edge of the lung, can actually influence the response rate. So again, you can't just look at this and say, oh, the best drug is X. Let's look at the one on the right-hand side. And this is where we get into even more details. I'm sorry about that. But this is when one prior TKI retreated and what the response rate is. First of all, you can see the numbers are much lower, 35%, 50%, 25%. You can also see that the absolute number of patients are lower. For new valent, we only have four patients. So is it really 25%? Or if they treat another 10 patients, will that number go up or down? When I look at this, what this is really telling me is that not everybody develops acquired resistance in the same way. If they all did, first of all, you would expect those numbers to all look the same. And secondly, you would expect them, assuming the drug actually worked, to have much higher numbers. This is telling you that people become resistant in different ways, and not all of these drugs work on them, and none of the drugs work on all of the mechanisms. You know, the best is 50% in this data set. And that's because some people become resistant by turning on another signaling pathway other than ROS1, in which case changing ROS1 inhibitor won't be the answer. Next slide. If I illustrate that with some details here, so we know, and Nasako mentioned this, that one of the on-target resistance mechanisms, one where ROS1 is simply turned back on in the presence of the drugs, is you develop a ROS1 mutation called G2032R. And if you look on the left-hand side, if you actually prove that somebody has G2032R after they progress on one of their prior therapies, suddenly the response rates aren't running 30%, they're running much, much higher because these drugs actually work on those. And again, if you pre-select for a group that the drug will work on, your response rates are higher. Again, I don't know if 59% is different from 78% when we're talking about nine patients and 17 patients, but it illustrates the point that not everybody develops resistance in the same way. If you look on the right-hand side, this is for the patients who have non-G2032R. Now, what does that mean? That means they didn't find G2032R. That could be they didn't find anything, so maybe G2032R is in there and missed. It could be that there are other mechanisms of resistance that were found or not found that were either on target, in which case the ROS1 TKI might work, or off target, a second driver, in which case none of these drugs will actually work. And again, you can see here, the numbers jump around a lot. They're clearly not working in everybody. The biggest issue with these, I think, is how well did they really look? If I find a G2032R, I know it's there. If I don't find it, it doesn't mean it's not there. So is a 48% response rate a false negative? Or is that telling me this works on other mechanisms of resistance? So confusing, but lots to play for. Next slide. Let's talk about control in the brain. So this has certainly evolved over the last few years. And I would say it really was the wild west in terms of you know, quantifying activity in the brain. People would include deposits in the brain of different sizes. They would include deposits in the brain that had or had not received prior radiation therapy. Not every trial captures these patients in the same way. In a perfect world, they would be something was of a big enough size that you could measure it and had not received prior radiation therapy with focused radiation, or if it had received radiation, it could have been whole brain radiotherapy and then clearly progressed on that. With all of that caveat and the irritation that not everybody presents stuff in the same way so you can really compare like with like, what we can say is clearly there is some activity of some of these drugs in the brain, but response rate isn't the only thing. It's gonna be about duration of control in the brain where usually it's a reflection of not enough of the drug getting in there. But I would say, so far, so good. We certainly know lorlatinib is very good at getting into the brain, and it's only manifesting a 54% response rate. And I suspect that's the tyranny of the small numbers we've got here. I think if we did higher comparisons with equal numbers and equal stringency, maybe some of these would look a little bit more similar. Next slide. All right. We talked about duration of benefit. So this is the median progression-free survival. Remember, this takes into account those who respond and those who didn't respond. We already saw high response rates in the TKI naive setting. And what I think we're starting to see with these next generation drugs, particularly on the, on the yellow and blue graphs on the left-hand side, is that we are getting median progression-free survivals that are looking very promising, more than two years. 
That could be a reflection of how well these drugs are tolerated, could be a reflection of how well they control the brain, how well they suppress some of the mechanism of resistance before they actually manifest. So I would say, again, certain caveats about is 31 really different from 33 with small numbers, but so far so good. Misaka also mentioned that, you know, if you're going to prolong control, it's got to be tolerable. And we'll get to that in just a second. If you wait until acquired resistance has actually occurred, not surprisingly, there's more diversity in your cancer and it's hard to control the cancer longer. If you look on the right hand side, again, with the caveat that this is a heterogeneous population, different mechanisms of acquired resistance, we can see running about eight to nine months of median control. That doesn't mean everybody gets nine months and then it's game over. It just means the median, the 50% point is nine months, and then you have to do something. And that could be local radiation, it could be changing drug, it could be whatever. And you can see, for example, with the new valent, the data set that was very recently shown has just got the early endpoint of response rate. It doesn't have any duration of benefit shown. Next slide. So we talked about, we want to control the cancer, but we don't want to pay too much in terms of side effects. How do you interpret safety information? Well, it's, it's a little bit of a nuanced art. So dose reductions are usually manifested by rules within the study. If this happens, you have to reduce the dose. So it's not all the same. Um, for example, some drugs that put up some blood test abnormality that you wouldn't care about in the real world, in the study, you still have to reduce the dose. Others might be much more symptomatic. You can see that there is a difference. Prozotina tends to be relatively well tolerated, but some of the dose reduction occurs later and studies that are written up after a short amount of follow-up may miss some of the late onset side effects of prozotinib, which includes swelling. The other drugs you can see running about 20 to 30% dose reduction rate. And is that an issue? Well, I guess there's two things here. So one is if the adverse event rate is high and the dose reduction rate is low, is that because people get used to it or they're putting up with the side effects? And Sometimes, you know, we always think you have cancer, you have, to, you have to suffer. And I don't think that's true. I think this makes me worry that some of these drugs are perhaps slightly overdosed. We mentioned the fact that the drugs that end in NTREC, um, which is really um, entrectinib, repotrectinib, talotrectinib, and to some extent, lorlatinib, also hit a pathway called NTREC, which there are four, there are three different pathways, A, B, and C, and they're hit in different ways. And they give you essentially weird side effects. So they can range from altered taste, that's dysgeusia, dizziness, altered sensation, that's dysesthesia. They can alter your thinking, they can alter your mood. Um, and sometimes they can just sort of alter how well you know where your legs are, how well you walk across the room. And I think some of these are certainly problematic for some of these drugs. If you look at talotrectinib, they haven't reported any, and they're the drug that has deliberately dialed out the in-track activity which is encouraging with their relatively small data set so far. Um, talotrectinib hasn't really dialed it out, but appears to hit some of the NTRAC agents, um, more, uh, some of the NTRAC pathways more than others, and maybe you just get the, the right pattern. One should point out, though, that the talotrectinib data is entirely derived from China, and you know, would we get the same subjective uh, side effects if we did this in a Western population? And of course, those are the questions that regulatory agencies tend to ask as well. Next slide. But taking things at face value, if you look just at dizziness, there is clearly a spectrum of activity across the drugs. We're not showing you valent because we don't have that data. Headache, altered taste, that's the dyscusia, and ataxia, that's you know, uh, poorly coordinated movement of your limb. And certainly this is something that I think if, if you're thinking about going on this drug and you're thinking about going on it for several years, you could just try it and see, but it might influence your initial choice. Next slide. And I think the biggest question is, while it might seem like the obvious thing to do is, as New Valence done to dial out the NTRAC activity, there is a theory that there may be, the NTRAC may not just be all, all bad, it may have some good too. There's some evidence, particularly in breast cancer, that if you inhibit NTRAC, it can also protect your brain. Somehow NTRAC is involved in the seeding of deposits of cancer into the brain. If that's true, you won't see that in any of the early data sets where we're looking at progression-free survival and response rates. But in a more mature data set, 
if they track people without brain metastases, you might be able to see evidence of a protection when there is NTRAC activity and less protection when there isn't. But that's all theory at present. I'm just throwing it out there that we're still figuring out whether NTRAC is all good or NTRAC is all bad or somewhere in between. Next slide. Well, thank you for listening. I get to pass you back to the lovely Janet. Thanks, Ross. Uh, we're, so if you have questions, um, please click on the Q&A link down at the bottom of the screen and use that to submit your questions. So let's just have start a general discussion as the questions start coming in. If you're considering a treatment option, what would your be what would your considerations be if the patient had never had a TKI, either no treatment whatsoever or perhaps had chemo first? Um, who would you who would you like to go first? You're the chairwoman. Oh wow, such power. <laughs> Um, Masako, how about you go first? Sure. Um, so in the TKI naive setting, um, well, in all settings, I would say I want to look at the disease burden. Does the patient have brain metastasis, comorbidities? Um, how um, is their social life? Are, are they living alone? Do they have a partner? Are they working? Um, and I will consider all of that and have a discussion, preferably because I think the newer upcoming Asians are more promising. Um, if available, I would want to offer clinical trials to patients. Um, but if those are not available in the TKI naive setting, I would likely offer entrectinib given better brain penetration when compared to crizotinib. Okay. Well, Ross, I'll give you the second half of this question then. Um, if a patient comes to you and has been treated with chemotherapy already, would you have them stop or would you have them switch to a TKI? You mean they're, if they're currently on chemotherapy and controlling their disease? If they're on chemotherapy, whether it's controlling it or not, can consider both. Okay. Well, if it's not controlling it, that's a super easy one because why would you continue it? So I think I would switch there. If it is controlling it, it becomes a bit more nuanced. Do you walk away from something that is working to something which is likely to work, but you haven't proven it in that individual? Again, it kind of depends on how well they're tolerating the chemotherapy. If it's a walk in the park every three weeks, you know, if they're a, a long-term pemetrexid responder, maybe you just keep the ace up your sleeve. I don't think there's a right or a wrong answer. I think you just have that conversation. Okay. So now let's consider the case where a person has been on a ROS1 TKI and they're experiencing progression. What are your considerations for treatment in that case? And I'll have Ross go first this time. So the first, so we're assuming these are patients all with metastatic disease. So the first question is, um, where is the progression occurring? Is it in the body or the brain? And then the second question is, how many sites are progressing? So what I'm really trying to figure out from that is, is this just, you know, a little weed growing somewhere and everything else is super well controlled and I can control it with local therapy and stay on the same drug, particularly if that's a drug that somebody is tolerating well and is happy with? Or if they're saying I've hated this drug and I've been looking for a reason to get away from it, then there's a much easier decision to move away. Again, it depends on which drug you're on. Um, if you're on crizotinib and you progress in the brain, that's usually because not enough of the drug is getting up there. So you have multiple options of drugs which just get into the brain better, including entractinib. If you're progressing in the body, you're clearly exposed to the drug, and therefore the biology of the cancer must have changed. It must have evolved in the environment of the drug. And while you can certainly switch to you know, the next available ROS1 TKI, I think in academic centers, we would try and biopsy and actually try and figure out a mechanism of resistance so that we're not just throwing it against the wall and see if it sticks. Masako, do you have anything to add? Um, no, nothing really to add. I echo Ross's recommendation. So sites of progression are important. A number of sites of progression is also important to consider. And if possible, at the time of progression, I do encourage my patients to rebiopsy, whether it be tissue or liquid, preferably both, um, to determine the reason why they're progressing, to figure out why the drug has stopped working. And if there is um, um, a resistant mechanism that is identified, um, we could 
perhaps match them to a better drug that could inhibit that resistant um, mechanism. So I think it is uh, useful to try to re-biopsy um, at the time of progression of disease. Right. Thank you. Well then, Masako, I'll take you to the next question. So if a patient has had multiple TKIs and their cancer is progressing, would your uh, options be different? Um, so again, if this is like just progression in the brain, perhaps the drug wasn't penetrating the brain enough. If we've exhausted all TKIs, perhaps time for radiation or even whole brain radiation for that matter. Um, and then if there are, um, are already progressed on multiple lines of TKIs and if they're progressing um, mainly in the body, and sometimes I see um, pleural effusion, pericardial effusion, um, that kind of situation, I oftentimes rely on chemotherapy at that point in time. So Ross, um, at some point, would you recommend a patient go on a clinical trial? What would be your, your thoughts as to why a tr clinical trial would be a better choice than an existing TKI? So the simplistic answer is you should always consider a clinical trial at every stage of therapy, but it's not always going to be the right answer. So if you've just been diagnosed and having to travel to go on a clinical trial may be inconvenient. If it's just on the other side of the street, maybe this is your chance to get access to something that isn't yet licensed. In terms of later line, when we're rebiopsing and understand mechanism resistance, it's quite possible that the drug you really need is only available in a clinical trial. So it's not clinical trial good or bad, it's what's in the clinical trial and is it right for you? And that's where you kind of need um, you know, a kind of big brother to help you make those decisions. Well, we've mentioned doing a rebiopsy more than once. How important is it to get a rebiopsy if you're on a ROS1 TKI and your cancer progresses? Is it my turn? Sure. Uh, then I'll come to <laughs> you. You're a terrible chair. All right. Thank you. I Here's appreciate that. <laughs> Okay, so where was I? Um, whilst I abused the chair. Um, so uh, I think Masako mentioned kind of blood and tissue. So I think one of the key things is blood is easy to rebiopsy. And if you see something, you can usually believe it. But if you don't, it doesn't mean it's not there. So if you don't find a mechanism resistance on blood, you've really got to do a tissue biopsy. And I, I do think, you know, if you, if you imagine that half the people listening here wouldn't have the treatment they had in the first place if someone hadn't molecularly profiled them and said you're not lung cancer, not otherwise specified, you're ROS1. If profiling is important, then it's just as important in the acquired resistance setting because it's not, not everybody does things in the same way. Okay. Um, Masako, what is your experience with this? Sure. Um, in a perfect world, I would like to have um, biopsy of tissue as well as blood. Um, because as Ross mentioned, um, blood isn't always perfect. However, it's easier, it's less invasive. And if we can find the answer from blood, I, I think we can believe in that. It's just that um, when there are patients who don't really shed in cancer into their bloodstream, um, sometimes we don't detect these changes in the blood, but just because we don't detect them doesn't mean that it's not there. So that's why I think doing both is important. And personally, I've never seen this. I wonder if Ross has seen this, but theoretically histology transformation is also possible. So um, in a scenario where it's not making sense, there's this um, area that have all of a sudden rapidly evolved, um, I do think that there is a role for tissue biopsy, especially if it can be done safely, if it, the spot of progression is feasible to a biopsy, because you never know. Um, and I see this much more often in EGFR patients, um, but I've seen um, small cell transformation or squamous cell transformation, and sometimes that can um, help guide um, treatment. I don't know if Ross has ever seen Ross no, I mean, no, transform. It's a, it's, a great, it's a great question. I mean, but, it's, but it's, I think re it's, it's reported, but I personally haven't seen small right. cell transition yet. We've had Theoretically two possible. Three. We've, we've seen two or three in the, in the Ross in the group. Yeah. Yeah. And, and in one case, it was a large cell cancer. Oh, wow. Like a neuroendocrine. 
Okay. Right. And and you kind of wonder, maybe they had like a mixed um, histology from the beginning and yeah. the part that was ROS1 positive, most likely adeno responded to treatment. And maybe the patient had um, two different histology from the get-go and the one that didn't have ROS or the, the one that um, had a different histology didn't respond. So I, I don't know if I can call it transformation, but good to consider a tissue biopsy when it's not making sense. Can I throw something out? there as well. So one of the things when you get mixed histology, so adenosquamous, so it looks like adenocarcinoma from glandular tissue and squamous cancer from lining tissue, is the question is which one do you give you know, the, the, the greater emphasis to? The reason it matters is some of our chemotherapies, for example, pemetrexid or elliptic chemotherapy, is supposedly not to be given to squamous cancer. Mm -hmm. Yet we've actually published a series that when it's adenosquamous, it will respond. So you have to be careful about the prejudices that we slap on if you just have a little bit of something else there. Well, we have a, a question that came in. Um, are, is the G2032R mutation ever found in patients at diagnosis? And what other off-target mutations do we see in this ROS1 population? Um, Masaka? So I will answer the second part of the question. So other <laughs> you're just cherry picking <laughs> what you answer. <laughs> yes. um, other um, bypass resistant uh, um, uh, mechanisms have been reported um, in patients with ROS1 treated with TKIs, and these include things like MET amplification, KIT, and HER2. I'm sure there's others as well. Um, so can G2032R exist at baseline? So in theory, it could. I mean, these things are selected out in the environment of the drug. So I guess they could suddenly arrive today, or they could have been there at a microscopic proportion, you know, the day you were diagnosed and then enriched over time. It becomes a little bit of an academic argument. I think the bigger question is really, is G2032R ever dominant at diagnosis? And I would say no. Okay. So speaking of, of what we detect at diagnosis, is there an optimal diagnostic test you use to detect ROS1? Next generation sequencing. Next generation sequencing? Yes. Yes. Although on, on that point, when we talked about rebiopsy and look for mechanisms of resistance, whilst we tend to use next generation sequencing for that, there are a couple of caveats there. So some of the mechanism of resistance that Masako mentioned was um, amplification of some other genes like MET. And the ability of next generation sequencing to call amplification is highly variable because mm -hmm. not all NGS assays are the same and they don't all have the same bioinformatics software inside it. So just occasionally we have had patients who their NGS, next generation sequencing, doesn't show a mechanism required resistance, but we'll do a different test called MET fish testing and we'll find med amplification. So again, devil's in the details. So since we're talking about testing, many people who get the full panel testing at NGS also get PDL1 testing, which might indicate a high percentage of PDL1. And some people would think that automatically may, means they should get immunotherapy. Is there a role for immunotherapy in ROS1 cancer? And Ross, you can go first this time. I think we just had a paper eventually published, it took forever to get published, where we literally searched the world for any gene rearrangements, ALK, ROS, RET, that had actually clearly responded to immune monotherapy, and that's PD-1 or pd one inhibitors. And I mean, it's like single figure patients that, you know, they're like unicorns. So it's not that it can never happen, but you're probably more likely to be struck by lightning than you are to actually respond to immune monotherapy if you have ROS1 or ALK. I'm going to modify the question a little bit for you, Masako. We're having people join the group now who are stage three and are given um, immunotherapy chemo combinations in hopes of curing their cancer. And then when the doctor sometimes wants to give them a TKI afterwards as, as an adjuvant therapy, do you have any comments on that? So um, just to clarify, I would assume that if the patient is stage three, probably they got chemotherapy and radiation, and then they were followed up by um, immunotherapy. 
Um, and then we detect ROS1, and then we're not really sure what to do. Is, is that kind of like the situation or the scenario? Getting a whole mix of situations. <laughs> Some of them get they get the testing and go straight to treatment. And while they're in treatment, they find out they're ROS1. Or after they've um, had their treatment, they find out that they're ROS1 and the doctor thinks to put them on a ROS1 TKI right after they've had immunotherapy. So, yeah, so, so um, I guess there could be different scenarios and um, the particular scenario that you mentioned, considering a ROS1 TKI right after immunotherapy, I think is potentially very dangerous. Um, to be honest, I don't think there is great level of evidence in the ROS1 space just because um, the, the fusion itself is very rare compared to other types of driver mutations like EGFR or ALK. But we know from the EGFR and ALK space that not only is single agent immunotherapy in these patients um, have only limited efficacy, it could be potentially dangerous because there are reports to suggest that in EGFR patients, for example, we know that using immunotherapy prior to TKI could increase the risk of pneumonitis and other immune-related adverse events. For that matter, in ALK patients, immune-related hepatitis has been reported. So in theory, I think um, increased risk of immune-related adverse events in patients also with ROS1, um, if they were given immunotherapy up front, followed by ROS1 TKI is, is very possible. And um, that is one of the reasons I would um, be against uh, using immunotherapy in ROS1 patients. But again, um, because ROS1 is a rare population con compared to the other driver mutations, I don't think we have um, a good level of evidence to, to suggest such. Okay. Uh, we have a question about an option once you've gone through all of the TKIs um, in power combination, co pure chemo, whatever. So if someone has ROS1 positive cancer, they've gone through all those options, are there other clinical trials such as um, cellular therapy or something that people might consider? Maybe I'll take this one. So cellular therapy is a bit like where P1 was 10 or 15 years ago, or maybe 10, 10 or five or 10 years ago. So in the sense that it's a bit unknown and everybody has lots of hope on it. There is, if you remember Jerry Maguire, it's like, show me the money. It's like, show me the data. So I haven't seen any good information yet that cellular therapy works. It doesn't mean it won't work. It just means we don't have the data. At present, in terms of clinical trials, probably what I'm most interested in is antibody drug conjugates, which is like smart chemo, and they home to markers on the surface of the cell. Most ROS1 fusions are actually intracellular. A few of them are extracellular. So it would usually be a surface marker that's separate from the ROS1, just associated with it. And there, the issue is that many of the clinical trials with ADCs, antibody drug conjugates, are kind of monotherapy, whereas what we really want is to sort of stay on the ROS1 TKI and then add in the ADC. So that's that's a work in progress. I don't know, Masaka, what are you excited about? I am also excited about uh, ADCs. Um, I think using um, overexpressed um, genes and using it as a target to deliver chemotherapy more efficiently makes a lot of sense. And the beauty is that um, anyone, even if you have EGFR, even if you have ROS1, ALK, um, could be overexpressing these targets, right? So um, I, I know that it's very tricky to find that target um, because you want to make sure it's not so much expressed in wild type or normal tissue because you want to avoid side effects, right? But if we can identify a target and if we can connect that with an antibody drug conjugate and deliver chemotherapy directly, I think that is our um, next best shot after direct targeted therapy um, because it, it's difficult um, to keep on developing new targeted therapy. So here's a case that comes up often. If you have a patient who's on one of the first generation TKIs, especially presotinib, that doesn't treat the brain and it's got the body under control, but they progress in the brain, would you switch to another TKI that does treat the brain or would you use radiation to treat the brain and keep them on the original TKI? 
Um, Masako? Sure. Um, I prefer to use um, a TKI with better brain penetration um, if possible. Um, and I would, assuming that the patient is not symptomatic from the brain metastasis, it's not like the patient's bleeding or having like paralysis of that kind of stuff. Um, but I, I would try to use the brain penetrating TKI first, assuming that the patient is somewhat stable, and then leave the um, SRS or gamma knife or whole brain radiation option for later. Okay, Ross? I, I think that there's, a, again, there's, a, there's always nuances here. So if you have a solitary small deposit in the brain and everything has been fabulously well controlled, and uh, the use of radiation is really about putting off some change in systemic therapy. And the question is, is that a systemic therapy that you want to put off or are you upgrading to a better tolerated, more effective drug? If you're putting off something which is a whole bunch of side effects, I'd probably use the radiation. But the, the caveat is, well, what if every time you do the scan, there's another brain metastasis? So at some point you have to kind of, you know, listen to what the scans are telling you. Yeah, very much. Have you, Either of you has been using um, chemo plus a TKI in order to treat progression, and does that seem to work well? So Ross? is this the question that when you get to the chemo stage, do you stop the TKI or do you keep the TKI going? So yes. none of us none of us know, in inverted commas, the right answer, but many of us, we'll see if Masako agrees or not, tend to add in the chemotherapy and keep the TKI going especially in the setting of brain metastases, which might be controlled by the drug. Absolutely agree. Um, do you have any sense of what the response rate is to that? Do most people respond? Or I realize this is just based on anecdotal evidence. Well, it's really, there. are they responding to the chemo? So it depends on which chemo and whether they've had chemo before, but the, that I actually don't know what the average response rate to alpha-platin pemetrex it would be in Ross 1, but I imagine it would be pretty high, 40, 50% or something. Yeah, there were a couple of papers that showed that it was higher in general for ROS1 than other chemos. Yeah. So all of the all of the out, sorry, all of the gene rearrangements out ROS RET, and probably NTRAC, although nobody studied it, having exaggerated sensitivity to pemetrexid for reasons that we don't understand. Not 100 percent but you're more likely to respond to pemetrexid than you are to other standard chemos and compared to other drive oncogenes like EGFR RK RETs. Okay. If you had a newly diagnosed patient come to you and they were interested in treatment, would you refer them to a first-line clinical trial as opposed to um, automatically starting them on an existing approved therapy, given that these new therapies tend to be getting into the brain better? I, I would encourage um, patients to consider clinical trials, but as Ross mentioned, it kind of depends on the scenario and situation, right? It might not make sense if you have to travel uh, thousands of miles just to get to treatment um, in the first line setting. However, um, if it is um, available um, rather uh, close by and if it does not disturb, like for example, your work schedule or your family schedule or whatever, I think consideration of clinical trials would be appropriate. Um, I would be careful though, um, and different studies are at different time points in their course of the, the lifespan of studies. And some studies um, may be using a lower dose because they want to first collect safety data. And many of these studies will eventually allow um, interpatient, that, that means in the same patient, um, dose escalation once that uh, higher dose level is considered safe. But um, I, I am sometimes a little bit careful uh, when I see treatment naive patients, um, and I, I always encourage them to consider clinical trials. But at the same time, I want to make sure that um, there is a reasonable chance that they would have benefit over standard of care when I um, uh, encourage clinical trials. Okay. Ross, I'm gonna shift questions on you. Okay. Um, do we have any evidence of what might be associated with causing Ross1 positive cancer? And do you see a difference in populations between smokers and non-smokers? 
Well, so we there are some things we can rule out. So it doesn't appear to be associated with smoking. So um, the assumption, therefore, is there's some other cause of ROS1. I mean, you can be a you can be a smoker and get ROS1. It's just less likely compared to all of the other kinds of lung cancer you can get. There are a couple of hypotheses. So radon gas has been thrown out there, or some kind of radiation exposure. Um, which is impossible to prove in an individual. It's kind of, there's some studies were sort of done, mostly in elk, looking at sort of geographic regions, but, you know, radon gums up through kind of fissures in the ground. And so you can have two houses next to each other with wildly different uh, radon levels. So it's not perfect, they said. I mean, the other hypotheses are, this is some legacy of a virus that sort of infected you, jumped into your DNA for a while and then jumped out again and left a messy footprint. But all of this is, you know, high in the sky. Nobody can prove it in an individual. We're running close to out of time, so I'm going to lump some of these questions together. What kind of research is there going into different resistance mutations and whether one treatment is better for one type of resistance mutation than another? Um, we probably don't understand all of them yet. So, uh, Masako? So, I, I think... We don't have answers yet, but we're trying. And many of the studies um, that Ross had mentioned um, ask patients for um, tissue or blood samples at the time of enrollment and at the time of progression. So hopefully we'll get more answers as we accumulate more data from patients. Ross, do you have anything to add? I, I think... Um... I think the single most important thing to remember is that not everybody's ROS1 cancer becomes resistant in the same way. Mm -hmm. And in addition, not all of them turn back on ROS1 signaling and just need a different ROS1 inhibitor. And that means that just chasing down the next ROS1 inhibitor in a clinical trial halfway across the country may be a complete waste of time if you actually have a second driver where what you need is two drugs combined. The trouble is there's no there's no drug company pushing that combination approach, but it goes on in academic centers. And I think that to me is the, there, there isn't one answer to everybody. Okay, um, so any comments on the possibility of vaccine therapies for ROS1? Jerry Maguire answer, show me the data. <laughs> and we don't have anything yet. Well, so the, the, the key thing is, so for a, a vaccine, almost like, you know, when we all went, we went through this with COVID, your early endpoint is showing that, you know, you give somebody a vaccine and they make antibodies, or maybe you give them a vaccine, you can show that their immune cells do something different. But then there's another leap of faith to show that that matters. So we might get the first bit coming out, but then you have to show that it matters. Hmm. All right, we're getting close to the end of time. I want to give each of you a, a minute to sum up. So Masako, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, first of all, thank you so much for the opportunity. I really enjoyed this discussion. Um, I think, as Ross has already mentioned, um, it's really important to um, get the best efficacious drug that is most tolerable to each individual because this is a marathon and not a sprint. And um, I, I hope that one day research can cure all of this, but until we get there, we need the support of um, our patients as well as um, other providers to get there and hope to work together with everyone. Ross? Well, so I, I think the thing I'd like to point out is just how amazing it is to actually have a patient advocate chairing this meeting. And even though they can't remember whose turn it is to speak, you did a fantastic job. In my own defense, my power went out while you were speaking, Ross. I actually had no idea what you said. We got a little scared. <laughs> it threw me a little bit. But right. that's 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 true teamwork, I think. Yes, I, I, I've really enjoyed this and enjoyed talking with both of you and your openness on your answers. So unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. And once again, I'd like to thank both the panelists, Masako and Ross, for their contributions to the discussion. Thank you, Anne Hart, for sponsoring and Endpoint News for hosting us today. And lastly, thank you to those of you who participated for joining us. Today's session has been recorded and will be made available on demand tomorrow. I'm Janet Freeman-Daly, and I hope to see you at a future Endpoints webinar.